Hi. So in this video, we're going to discuss the experimental physiology graphs, especially that of fatigue and recovery, the effect of temperature, the effect of load, and also the velocity of nerve impulse. So the first experiment is fatigue and recovery. So the aim of this experiment is to find out whether the nerve muscle preparation is fatigable, to know the seat of fatigability in isolated nerve muscle preparation, and also to know whether it is reversible. So for that, the experimental setup is same as that of a simple muscle twitch. The only difference is that we'll continuously stimulate the nerve muscle preparation until it gets fatigued. Okay. So when you draw the graph, we first draw the simple muscle curve and mark its points of stimulation and contraction and all. And after that, the next few contractions will be seen to have a more amplitude and that is because of beneficial effect. So see, after the simple muscle curve, we see that in the next contractions will have a lesser latent period, a greater amplitude, lesser contraction period and a lesser relaxation period, all of which is due to beneficial effect, right? And after that, the muscle will start getting fatigued. So the latent period will increase, the contraction period and the relaxation period will increase and the amplitude will start decreasing. And finally, it will reach a point that the contractions will fail to relax completely and it will not touch the baseline. So such a condition is called contracture remainder or physiological contracture, right? So you have to mark all these points in the graph when you get this, okay? So now we want to know the seat of fatigue in isolated nerve muscle preparation. So what we do is we directly stimulate the muscle. So when we directly stimulate, we can see that we can still get a contraction, which means that the muscle has not get fatigued. So we can now we can also stimulate the nerve by means of a CRO and it will show that the CRO is also the nerve is also fati not fatigued, which means the seat of fatigue in an isolated nerve muscle preparation is a neuromuscular junction. So that is how we prove which is the seat of fatigue. Next, we want to know if it is reversible or not. So for that, we'll wash this uh, nerve muscle preparation thoroughly and then again stimulate it. And at the in that time we'll get a curve which is similar to a simple muscle twitch, which means that the fatigability, fatigue is reversible and that recovery is possible. Okay. Now the questions that can be asked for fatigue and recovery are, what is the site of fatigue in an isolated nerve muscle preparation? So as I said before, it's a neuromuscular junction. So remember when the question is to prove the seat of fatigue in an isolated nerve muscle preparation, the graph that you have to draw is that of this fatigue and recovery because this is the isolated nerve muscle preparation. Next, mention one cause of fatigue in this preparation. Why is there fatigue? That is because of accumulation of waste products like lactic acid as well as depletion of ATP and acetylcholine. These are two of the reasons why there is fatigue in this nerve muscle preparation. The other questions that can be asked are what are the factors favoring fatigue and what are the factors favoring recovery? Okay. Next, we'll move on to the next experiment, which is the effect of afterload and preload on contraction. So here, the experiment is the only difference in the experimental setup is that we are applying load on this isotonic muscle lever. So what happens is the muscle will have to contract along with this load, right? So initially, we'll take contractions, we'll increase the load and take the muscle contractions. And after that, we will remove this afterload screw. So now what happens is the load will directly act on the muscle even before contraction. And that is how we'll convert this experimental setup from afterload to preload, right? So when we draw the graph, we first draw the effect of afterload. So we we'll first draw the simple muscle curve and then we'll slowly uh, add on the load and draw the curve. So here you can see this is the graph obtained when the load was five gram, five gram, right? So here you can see that the latent period has increased, the amplitude has decreased, as well as the contraction and the relaxation period has decreased. And also you can see that here the lever has come down fast because of the effect of load. Next, as you increase the load, you can see that the curve is getting smaller and smaller. The amplitude is getting smaller and smaller. The latent period is increasing. The relaxation, the contraction period is decreasing. See, this is for 10 gram and then for 15 gram, then for 20 gram. 25 gram and finally when you increase it the it will reach a state that the muscle cannot lift that load and here in this case it is 40 gram okay now what we'll do is we'll release that offload screw and make it to do that preload setup and then we again try to stimulate 
at that time we can see that the muscle is now able to lift that 40 gram when it was in the preload setup so here also you can mark the point of stimulation the point of contraction the point of maximum contraction the point of relaxation now one thing you must have noticed is there's a slight slant for this graph why is it so see i said that this is our isotonic lever and this is our afterload screw okay so as after we put all the load and finally it reaches this 40 gram wherein the muscle is no longer able to contract we release this afterload screw right so now the position of the lever will, will be something like this that is why this there is a slant for all these curves that are present in this graph of, on the effect of preload okay so when you draw the graph also remember you have to draw, draw both these in the same paper and also you have to show this slant in order to know that the afterload screw is removed and that the experiment is in a preload setup okay now the questions that can be asked are name the law that is proved so here the muscle was able to lift the load when it was in the preload setup which means that the when the load was acting before the muscle contract muscle contracts the length of the muscle is increased so when the length was increased it was able to do more work okay and so that law is the starling's law which states that the force of contraction of the muscle is directly proportional to the initial length of the muscle fiber within physiological limits so why is it that when uh, the initial length is increased that the force of contraction is increased well that is because when the initial length is increased there is correct opposition or the optimum opposition of the actin and the myosin filaments which will enable an increased force of contraction okay the other questions that can be asked are what is afterload and preload and also what are the physiological examples of these right so the next experiment is the effect of temperature on muscle contraction so in this we use this lucas trough in which here you will fill it with warm saline or cold saline and then immerse the nerve muscle preparation into it and then take the recording with the help of this lever okay so when we draw the graph you first draw the simple muscle curve and mark its points and then we will pour warm saline into that Lucas trough and so you can see that the latent period has decreased the contraction period as well as the relaxation period has decreased and the amplitude has increased when warm saline was poured see the range is around 37 to 38 degrees celsius and now what we do is we replace this warm saline with cold saline so at that time you can see that the latent period has increased the amplitude has decreased the contraction and the relaxation period has increased and so this is the effect of cold saline now here why do we say this is an ideal graph well that is because when we actually obtain it on the drum it is quite different that is because of the inertia of the lever so here in the obtained graph the simple muscle twitch will be as such but for the effect of warm saline we can see that the graph obtained will have a more relaxation period that is because the lever will take time to come down after this height of amplitude that is why when we when we obtain the graph the graph will be like this right similarly for cold saline we can say that the relaxation period is lesser here again is due, due to the inertia of the lever okay so there are two graphs for tem effect of temperature one is the ideal graph and other one is the obtained graph so the questions that can be asked in case of effect of temperature are what is the practical application of these experimental findings so here you saw that when the temperature was increased the force of contraction was increased so this is the importance of warm-up before an exercise okay next what is the clinical application of hypothermia see in open heart surgeries low temperature is used because when in low temperature the metabolic activities are less so in this case you saw that that when cold saline was poured the force of contraction was decreased so that is the application for hypothermia and we should also know the differences between a heat trigger and a cold trigger also the definitions what is a heat trigger and what is a cold trigger okay so now the last experiment is that of velocity of nerve impulse so the aim of this experiment is find out the velocity in the sciatic nerve of a frog so to do this experiment what we are doing is see when we prepare an isolated nerve muscle preparation we know that the sciatic nerve has got two ends one is at the vertebral end and another is the muscular end right so here we've got this is the vertebral end of the sciatic nerve and this is the muscular end of the sciatic nerve so basically we stimulate the sciatic nerve at two ends one at the vertebral end and other at the muscular end 
and then we find out the time taken to travel this distance. So thus we'll get the velocity as length divided by time. Okay, so that is how we find out the velocity of nerve impulse in case of sciatic nerve. So to draw the graph, draw the baseline and then mark the recording that we obtained when we stimulated the vertebral end. So see, this is the point of stimulation. This is the point of contraction at the vertebral end. This is the point of maximum contraction and this is the point of relaxation at the vertebral end. Now we move the electrode to the muscle end and then stimulate it. So we'll get a curve in which the latent period is much reduced. Why? Because the electrode is nearer to the muscle. And also we'll get a curve of increased amplitude. Why? Because of beneficial effect. So this is the point of contraction of the muscle end and this is the point of relaxation of the muscle end. See, so now we have to find out the difference in the latent period of these two curves. For that, we have to draw the time tracer on top of this baseline. So like that, we'll know the difference between the point of contraction of the muscle end and the vertebral end. So this will be a time in that formula. Velocity is equal to length by time. So this difference in the latent period is at time. Okay. So now we've got everything to find out the velocity. We've got the length, which is the distance of the nerve between the two electrodes. That is between the muscle end and the vertebral end. So that is our L. And also the difference in the latent period between these two points of contraction. That is our time, T. So like that, we can find out the velocity of the sciatic nerve. Okay. Now the other questions that can be asked is, what is the clinical importance of this? See, if the velocity of nerve impulse transmission is more, we will get more accurate results in a very small time. So we know that our spinocerebellar pathway is the fastest pathway. It's the nerve impulse velocity is around 120 meters per second. That is why we get quick information about a proprioception within a very short time. Another applied aspect is the nerve conduction velocity can be affected in neuropathy. So in case of peripheral neuropathies, we can test the nerve conduction velocity and diagnose it. Similarly, we can also know the effect of hypoxia, pressure and drugs like anesthetics which also affect the conduction velocity. So these are the applied aspects of the clinical importance of velocity of nerve impulse. So in this video we have discussed the effect of fatigue and recovery. We have also proved that it is reversible and proved the seat of fatigue in isolated nerve muscle preparation. We have seen the effect of afterload and preload. Then we have discussed the effect of temperature and saw the ideal and the obtained graph and also the velocity of nerve impulse. So I hope this concept is clear for you. Thank you.